Um, my name is Lucy Campbell, and I am a junior in physics and math double major. And this year I did research with Dr. Sally in the physics department on grouping, and specifically optical spectroscopy and time domain studies. Okay, so we had three main goals of the project. <laughs> so obviously the first goal was to learn about optical spectroscopy, because this was the foundations of understanding what we were doing. And then we had two main experiments. One where we took the emission spectra of a ruby crystal that Dr. Sally actually grew. And then the second experiment was taking a time resolved analysis of this crystal. Okay, so to understand spectroscopy, we need to understand light because light is the foundation of spectroscopy. But the main thing to understand is that every photon has a specific wavelength that corresponds to a specific energy. And then additionally, we need to understand what ruby is composed of. So ruby and sapphire are actually very similar in the sense that they have um, an aluminum atom um, surrounded by an oxygen cage. And the only difference between the two is that, um, so ruby is doped with chromium. So you can imagine that for every 1,000 aluminum atoms in this oxygen cage, we have about one chromium atom. And um, so we are going to be looking at the energy levels of ruby. So let me remind you of the Bohr's model from basic chemistry. <laughs> May have been a while for some of you. <laughs> so Bohr's model is the basic idea of how electrons move between energy levels. And these transitions between energy levels can be observed through photon absorption and emission. And when an electron falls back down to its ground state, it is typically a longer wavelength than the photon that excited the atom. Thus, energy was lost, but we'll look into this later. Um, so what we are doing is looking at the wavelengths of light coming in and out to tell us about these energy levels. Okay, so looking at chromium specifically, chromium is in the D block um, of the S, P, and D <coughs> if you remember what those are. Um, and there are three electrons in the d orbital. And when the chromium ion is alone, like on the left side of this picture, um, each orbital is the same energy. But when chromium is placed into a crystal field, like on the right side of this picture, um, we have two groupings where one set of orbital configurations has the orbitals pointing away from the oxygen atoms, so like in this picture down here, and then the other one has the orbitals pointing at the oxygen atoms, like in this picture up here. And so um, the one that I just pointed at is the higher energy state, and the other one is the lower energy state. So if you remember Hund's rule, it tells us that when all of the, all of the spins of the electrons are aligned, um, the atom is in its lowest energy state. So that's what we're looking at right here. Um, and this is the ground state configuration. So conversely, there are two different types of excited states. And the first type is when an atom can go from one type of orbital configuration to the next. So, oops, sorry, <laughs> this one, my bad. So that's what we're observing here um, in this image. And then this is technically called the second excited state, or that's what we are observing in our research. But then what we are really looking at from our results is the um, first excited state. And so this is when the electron can have a spin flip um, and this is a physical chemistry view of the molecular orbitals, and what's really interesting to us is these energies of these <coughs> states. And we can represent all of these different states on an energy, uh, energy level diagram just like this one. Okay, so this looks a little bit complicated, but it's, it's not too bad. <laughs> on the x-axis, um, we have the distance of the orbitals <coughs> from the oxygen ions, and then on the y-axis we have the um, energy of the different and each of these um, wave functions is an electronic energy level, and within each of these we have these vibronic energy levels, lots of them. They're just not drawn in this picture for simplicity. Um, and when we excite an atom to a higher, with a higher energy photon, um, then it moves to you know, one of these higher um, energy states. And in this image, we have all of these electronic energy levels overlapping. So the electron is able to rattle down to this first excited state. So it can move right here along these purple lines. And then once it reaches the first excited state, and once again, this is for chromium, then it only has one option, and it's to um, decay radiatively down to the ground state. 
Um, and so when it's actually rattling around in these electronic states, um, through the vibrational states, this is non-radiance of decay, and so it's basically just losing energy through heat. And so that's why the photon that actually emits is of a lower energy than the original photon. Um, okay, so another thing to mention is that it takes a long time for the chromium atom to emit because um, the first excited state has, has a spin flip, um, like in the picture in the red over here. And this is kind of a complicated process, but the spin flip quantum mechanically has a low probability that is inversely proportional to the lifetime um, of the emission. And so it's just, all you need to know is that um, a long lifetime relates to a low probability and vice versa. And this is how we are actually able to find our lifetime values because the lifetime is on the order of milliseconds instead of like nanoseconds or something faster. Um, but if this seems really complicated, don't worry about it. This is how I felt at the beginning of the semester, but this is how I'm playing now. So. <laughs> So I've talked a lot about um, exciting atoms with photons, and this is how we actually did it in both of our experiments. We used lasers to excite the chromium atoms, and in one experiment we used a constant laser, and in the other we used a device to turn the laser on and off quickly. Um, that's just the one I'm showing you right now because it looks cooler than the other one. Um, so I thought I would use that one. And then we used a special detector to look for the lifetime in one experiment, and then in the other we used the spectrometer to look at the wavelengths. Okay, so looking at our first experiment, here is a schematic of what um, our experiment looked like when we took the emission spectra of the Ruby excitation. So we used a constant green laser, um, a 532 nanometer laser to excite the um, Ruby crystal. And then the um, emitted photons passed into the spectrometer over here. And then these photons passed through a grating that split the photons into their respective wavelengths, and then we were able to read this um, spectrum from the CCD camera that then connected to our software. And so that looks super simple, um, but this is what the lab actually looks like. Just a couple of wires, um, you know, not a big deal. And then here are our, our results. So first, looking at the x-axis, we have wavelength, and then on the y-axis, we have the intensity. We're not so much concerned with the intensity as we are with the wavelength, um, because that's what we were trying to find um, the emission. And we found two different peaks, one around 692 nanometers and one around 694 nanometers. <coughs> and then this is the exact same graph that I had on the previous page. I've just flipped it. So that way we're able to observe um, our results with the energy levels that I've already discussed. So kind of showing how this process worked. Um, so first we excited the atoms with the green laser, and then energy was lost through phonons or heat before um, the atom, before um, the decay occurred once it hit the, uh, the lowest, the first um, excited state. So then um, the atoms were able to decay, and that's when we um, observed our two points. Okay, so um, one thing to note about our results is that we had very narrow peaks, and this suggests that there was a forbidden transition that um, I talked about earlier, and this is just due to the first excited state. Um, and then furthermore, we also have two consecutive peaks, which is a little bit interesting, and this represents something called spin-orbit coupling, which is a pretty complicated idea, but just, you know, thinking generally, it's the interaction of the electron spin with the electrons motion around the nucleus. Okay, so moving into our second experiment, um, here's another simple schematic of what exactly we were doing. So we use something called a function generator that basically just turns the laser on and off super fast um, at whatever frequency we chose, which was 10 hertz, for example. And then, so we had to have the, um, the laser turn on and off to actually be able to observe the decay, otherwise it's just you know, constantly um, in that excited state, and we couldn't, you know, observe each decay. Um, and so then the laser, we used a blue laser this time, um, which was 4 or 5 nanometers, and it excited the ruby, 
and then the light passed through a filter into this device called a photodiode, which turned the um, which turned the intensity that it detected into a voltage that we could then read on the oscilloscope. Once again, um, it looks super simple, but this is what the actual lab looks like. Um, oh, there's sound on that. <laughs> and then this is how we felt on Wednesdays <laughs> after staring at the oscilloscope in the dark in what I like to call the dungeon for three hours. <laughs> okay, so here was our actual um, data. So we have um, time on the x-axis in seconds, and then we have voltage on the y-axis, and this is what we read off the oscilloscope. And then we have two different plots here. So the blue line is just the response from the function generator. So this is just when the laser turns on and when the laser turns off. And then the red dots, that's our actual data. And so we can observe um, the rise time and the decay time. So we're going to be looking at the rise and decay separately. Um, and this is just the same graph from before. I've just taken the two different sides. And so we have time on the x-axis. And then I turn the voltage into intensity. But it's directly proportional to the voltage. So um, it's the same graph. So looking at the decay results first, because this is what we're most interested in. So we used. Um, this exponential equation to model our data, and we were looking for tau, which is the decay time. And um, then if you're wondering about what ID is, it's just um, it's just the signal that the photodiode produced in the dark. So that's why our results don't actually go to zero, even though the decay has already happened at that point. Um, and then our results were super exciting. We found the decay time to be 3.5 milliseconds, which is what we, I mean, that's exactly what we were expecting from all of the literature. Um, so yes, very exciting. And then <laughs> looking at the rise time, um, so here are our rise results. This is less interesting um, because we have this power dependency. Um, so if you'll notice, the rise time is much smaller um, than the decay time. And this is something that we recognize, but we would like to investigate more in the future because it's a much more complicated process to understand the power dependency. And so that's definitely something we'd like to look at. So in addition to the power dependence, we'd like to investigate the temperature dependence of emission, so like cooling the system down, and then we would also love to take the absorption spectrum. Um, yeah, that's pretty much everything. <laughs> everything up on that table. There wasn't really a specific significance in 